I think I said this the first day of class. Have you found spiritual formation, spiritual growth to be easy or difficult? Why is it so difficult to change? Not only why is it so difficult to change, but why do so many bad things happen in the world? Why is that? What's wrong with us? And not only what's wrong with us, but what kind of opposition can we expect to encounter as we desire to become an apprentice of Christ? If we don't know the opposition, if we don't know the nature of the time in which we live, spiritual formation will be deeply puzzling and oftentimes deeply discouraging. Think, just think back to the last time when you said to yourself, frustratedly, you know, I'm never going to change. I'm always going to be like this. Or you think to the last time that someone did something or said something and it still remains with you, and you wonder, what's wrong with him? And then, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with the world that we live in? What's happened? But in order to understand the nature of the time in which we live, we really do need to understand what's happened in Christ. And, and this is a big asterisk, the relationship between this present evil age. Note that phrase. Note it. Write it down. The relationship between this present evil age and what Jesus calls the age to come. If we don't understand this dynamic, we'll understand very little of the New Testament. The relationship between this present evil age and the age to come, and the meaning, as Jesus teaches it, of the kingdom of God. We must understand this. So I want to walk you through this now. And I'm going to put an overhead up in just a moment. But to get started, I want you to be with me now in the scripture. So turn to Mark chapter 1. Now, it's interesting, Mark begins his gospel not by talking about Jesus' birth, but by focusing on John the Baptist. And John the Baptist announces that the Messiah has come. And then he's put in prison. Now, take a look at verse 14. It might help to underline every one of these texts. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. Verse 15. This is what Jesus announces. The time has come. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. So what's the good news? The time has come. The kingdom of God is near. That's the good news. So the question then becomes, when they hear what he says in verse 15, the time has come, the kingdom of God is near, repent and believe the good news, what are they then thinking is going to happen? Now, this is where it gets a little bit technical. So, I want you to memorize this chart. And let me walk you through it. So, what I've got here at the top of the chart is the Jewish eschatological hope. And if we don't know what the word eschatological means, the chart's not all that much help. So the Greek word eschatos, with an S on the end, the Greek word eschatos means last. So eschatology in systematic theology, eschatology is that branch of theology that, that dwells upon what? Last things. The end of history as we know it. You with me? End of history as we know it. The eschaton. What's the eschaton? It's the arrival of the end. So, Jesus in uh, Mark chapter 1, verse 15, announces that the time is at hand. The time is at hand. Every Jew listening to him in that crowd who'd grown up in the synagogue, when they hear the time is at hand, they begin to think that the eschaton is at hand. History's ending. We always knew it would when Messiah came. Now, that's their hope. Does this make sense now? That's their eschatological hope. Their hope was that, as Isaiah puts it, when the anointed one of God comes, all the nations will stream into Jerusalem. Jerusalem will be raised up above the people, all peoples. And the Lord's anointed will reign from Jerusalem. Now catch it. And evil will end. 
sin will end. All nations will enter into the wondrous reality of what it means to be in relationship with the God of Israel. Now here, this age is this present evil age. And then we have over here the age to come. Present evil age, age to come. Now see that dark line? In Jewish thinking, what that dark line means is this. When Messiah comes, this present evil age stops, ends, finished, with all of its characteristics. Sin ends, sickness ends, demon possession ends, evil people triumphing ends, injustice ends, it all stops. And the age to come is fully manifest, characterized by the presence of the Holy Spirit, righteousness, health, peace, no more sick people, no more war, no more genocide, no more Rwandas in 1994. It all stops with the arrival of the Messiah. All right, now back to the text. When Jesus, in verse 15, announces that the kingdom of God is near, and he says, repent and believe the good news and that the time has come, that chart kicks in. That's everybody's expectation of what's going to happen, including the disciples. They're thinking according to this chart. And what Jesus has to do, for instance, what Jesus has to do is, if this present evil age is indeed being invaded by the age to come, he's going to have to deal with sin. He's going to have to deal with the demonic. He's going to have a lot to say about issues of injustice. One would expect this, yes? If the age to come is, uh, is invading this present evil age. Now look how Mark does this. Verse 15, you have the arrival of the kingdom, right? Then you go down to verse 21, and there's an exorcism that takes place. A demon is driven out of somebody. Why? Because Mark wants us to see that the kingdom of God, the age to come, has come. So, that, so if so, there have to be exorcisms. Because that kingdom has to be invaded. The kingdom of the evil one has to be invaded. Look what happens here. They went into Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as someone who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Just then, now here's the exorcism. Just then, a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an evil spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. And look how he describes him. The Holy One of God. Well, what do you have here? You have this clash. You have this clash between the age to come and this present evil age. And a demonic reality is being confronted by the Holy One of God. So Jesus says in verse 25 in Greek, it's shut up. Be quiet. It's a very strong verb. It's an imperative. Fimositi said, sternly, come out of him. The evil spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. Quite a dramatic scene. So we have an exorcism. Now, Jesus, if this is in, in reality occurring, this present evil age being invaded by the age to come, there's got to be healings, right? Can you see why theologically? If this present evil age is characterized by sickness, if the Messiah has come, there has to be healings, or he can't be the Messiah. So Mark knows this, and so Jesus heals many. Verse 29 of chapter 1. He does many things that indicate that this present evil age is being invaded by the age to come. We've just seen it. He raises people from the dead, for crying out loud. He heals people. He's doing everything that people expected but then, but then things shift, and they shift. Now, asterisk, they shift in Mark chapter 8. So turn over there. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say that I am? That's a messianic question. Who do people say that I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, still others, one of the prophets. So they respond accordingly. Well, some think that you're John the Baptist come back from the dead. Others say Elijah. There was the expectation that Elijah would come back before the Messiah, still others, one of the prophets. So people are, are, are seeing certain things about Jesus, but they haven't got him figured out yet. So Jesus very pointedly says, but what about you? Who do you say 
that I am. So Peter says, you are the Christ. Now Christ, Greek, Christos, Hebrew, Mashiach, it means the anointed one of God. The anointed one of God. You are the anointed one of God. You are the promised Messiah. And here, then, Jesus says, don't tell anybody. Now, that's enough to confuse you, isn't it? Wait a minute. What do you mean, don't tell anybody? I thought this was all about telling people. Well, the reason he doesn't want them to tell anybody is that they don't understand the kind of Messiah he is going to be. And we see that in the very next thing that happens. Now, look at verse 31. We're almost there in terms of this first chart. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and does what? He begins to rebuke him. Now, Peter rebukes him, not simply because he loves him and doesn't want to see him harmed. He rebukes him because what Jesus just said makes no theological sense. Why? Here's why. The anointed of God, the blessed of God, cannot be, by definition, cannot be the cursed of God. Messiahs don't get cursed, they bless. And how can Jesus be the anointed one of God and then delivered over to be hung on a Roman cross? Because Moses, Peter's thinking, Moses has taught us. Do you remember that Moses teaching this? It's in Deuteronomy. Cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. For a capital crime in Israel, if you had murdered somebody, you'd be stoned to death. Your body would be hung from a tree until the sun went down as a sign that God's curse rested upon you. And here Jesus is predicting, after clearly showing for seven chapters in Mark's gospel, clearly showing he's the anointed one of Israel and acknowledging that Peter identifying him as such was true, then says, now I've got to go up to Jerusalem and I'm going to die as a cursed man forsaken of God, and Peter says, no, you're not. He begins to rebuke him. When, look at verse 33. When Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. And then look what he does. This is when the teaching gets hard. This is when, catch it. Look at this chart. This is when the chart splits. It doesn't work anymore in light of this teaching. He calls a crowd to him of Jewish people, not simply the, the disciples, and says, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And they're all saying, wait, no, no, no. You can't be cursed. You're the Messiah. And why would we be picking up crosses? Because that would be a sign that we're cursed of God. You see the problem? It's really a problem. They're expecting the full manifestation of the kingdom of God. They're waiting for the kingdom to be consummated. Lord, I can hear Peter. Lord. And they argue about this on the way up to Jerusalem. James and John. Lord, I want to sit on your right hand when you come fully in your kingdom. Remember that? I want to sit on your left hand. I want the place of honor. They're arguing about these things. They haven't got the slightest clue as to what this teaching is about. And they don't want it to happen. And I want you to see that. To die on a cross, to be hung from a tree, is to be cursed of God. It's a sign that God's curse rests upon you. For, Jesus says in verse 35, whoever wants to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. And at that point they say, now wait a minute. What do you mean, coming with your holy angels? You're already here. Are you going to be leaving? 
Why would you leave? Messiahs don't leave. Messiahs stay. Messiahs consummate the kingdom. None of this makes any sense. I don't like it. And we're going to change your mind. And in Mark chapter 9, 10, and 11, we see that effort. And it doesn't work. So I leave you with this. I ask you this question. How can the cursed of God be the blessed of God? <laughs> 